Hello, I'm Campbell McGrath. I'm a poet. I'm a professor of creative writing at FIU. Uh, I'm also the parent of two Ransom Everglades alums, so I'm especially happy to be here. Of course, I'm going to read some poems to you. That's why I get this special retro throwback microphone instead of like the Tom Cruise high tech microphone. I'm going to talk a little bit about poetry, how it connects us, and other things. Um, and I'm going to start by reading a poem. This first poem is called Saying No. Saying No. No, sir, absolutely not. Sorry, but no. Not sorry, actually, just no. Keep it simple, plain vanilla. Nope. Big N, big O, not happening. No way, no how. Negative, nah, -uh. ixne, net. No, 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 no. Not likely, not likely. Maybe, but I doubt it. <laughs> Possibly, conceivably, in theory. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, sure, okay. Why not? Oh, definitely, yes, wow, I mean, anything, anything at all. When can we begin? <laughs> Thank you. I, I wanted to start with that poem for, for two reasons, and the first is that I think it exhibits very clearly uh, the most obvious and also uh, astonishing thing about poetry, which is that it's an art form made entirely of words. Um, it's dematerialized. It's language and language alone. In that case, you want to switch me out? I do. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello? Am I good on this one? This one working better? It's still not Tom Cruise, but it's working better than the last one. Um, it's made entirely of words, entirely of language. And in, in, as that poem illustrates, it doesn't even really need a subject matter beyond language. That poem was entirely about a speech act, saying no, or perhaps not saying no. Uh, the second reason that I start with that poem is that it also mimics the reaction one gets sometimes from an audience when you come into a room saying you intend to speak about poetry. No, 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 uh, no. Hopefully we'll convert uh, some of those no's to yeses. Um, the second poem I want to read is a love poem. So it's a poem that does have a subject matter beyond speech itself. It's a poem uh, also about moving to Miami. I moved here about 21 years ago with my wife. And in one of the first winters we lived here, something that still seems miraculous to me happened when a, a colony of butterflies came and lived in our backyard. And they would fly off a day and do whatever butterflies do. And at night they came back and they, you know, they, they actually clung on to the roots of the orchid and fell asleep. And I, I was astounded. It seemed like a kind of... Uh, the kind of beautiful miracle that actually Miami is strangely uh, full of. But uh, this poem is called The Zebra Long Wing, which is the name of that kind of butterfly. It's actually our state butterfly here in Florida. The Zebra Long Wing. Forty years I've waited, uncomprehending, for these winter nights when the butterflies fold themselves like paper cranes to sleep in the dangling roots of the orchids boxed and hung from the live oak tree. How many there are, six, eight, eleven? When I miss the spikes and blossoms by moonlight, they stir but do not wake, antennaed and dreaming of passion flower nectar. Never before have they gifted us in like manner. Never before have they stilled their flight in our garden. Wings have borne them away from the silk of the past as surely as some merciful wind has delivered us to an anchorage of such abundant grace, Elizabeth. All my life I have searched without knowing it for this moment. You'll also notice about poets that were special because we don't have anything up on the audio-visual equipment. Um, as a poet, you don't get to put pictures up on a giant screen, you know, 30 feet tall. As a poet, you're very jealous of filmmakers and photographers and painters who get to do that. Because as a poet, you're always striving to create images, but again, you have this frustrating material of language alone with which to do it. 
that last poem was a poem about image building, trying to create just that moment in words alone. As a poet, you also don't get to have music and backup singers and drums and amplifiers. The music in your poem has to be the music of the language itself, structured and rhythmatized by you. So this next poem is a love poem again. Uh, this is a love poem that actually takes place in California. And it's a poem that, rather than building an image, is attempting to put the music in the poem. It's called California Love Song. To ride the Ferris wheel on a winter night in Santa Monica, playing nostalgic songs on a marine harmonica, thinking about the past, thinking about everything Los Angeles has ever meant to me, is that too much to ask? To kiss on the calliope and uproot world tyranny and strum a rhythm guitar Ron Wood would envy. To long for the lost, to love what lasts, to sing idolatrous praises to the stars. Is that too much to ask? Arm in arm to gallivant, to lark, to crow, to bask in a wigwam of circus-colored atomic smog. To quaff a plastic cup of Nepenthian eggnog over one more round of boardwalk skee-ball, to trade my ocean for a waterfall, to live with you or not at all. Is that too much to ask? That poem uh, is a kind of sonically rich tapestry. You notice that it rhymes. People are still very concerned sometimes when poems don't rhyme. And uh, rhyme is certainly a good thing, but poetry is, you have to realize, is a very, very nutritious and dense food source. Poetry is, is like fudge. And rhyme is a little bit like frosting, and you can put frosting on fudge, and it's good, but it's not necessary. <laughs> um, another thing I, you can do in poems, and that I like to do, is joke around a little bit. Um, I, 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 sometimes a poem is not a love story or a creator, creation of a place, it's just telling a funny story. Uh, this poem is another, uh, another Miami poem, and it's a poem about a friend of mine who, who lives in Miami, who I knew worked in the clothing manufacturing business, who was an executive. Um, I never knew his exact job title, though, till I read a story in the Miami Herald uh, right at the height of the crash. And they published an article about people whose salaries had been heavily cut, and, and my friend's salary had been heavily cut, although it was still so monumentally higher than the salaries of any poets or professors, that it, it, it didn't seem that important. But it also revealed the fact that my friend's job title, which I had never known, was Vice President of Pants. <laughs> and this poem is called Vice President of Pants. Vice President of Pants turns out to be my friend Marvin's job title at a local clothing manufacturer, as I learned from a recent newspaper article about victims of the downturn Though even after some serious erosion, his paycheck rolls enough bi-weekly zeros to belie whatever expectations you may have harbored about those who toil in the vineyards of leisure wear. And I can't help but envy the director of knee socks and the undersecretary of ascots and wonder whether the alcalde of Guayaberas might be hiring an assistant sometime soon because in all honesty, this poetry gig is like feeding chocolate donuts to a hungry tiger or planting sunflowers on the moon. Uh, a tiny follow-up to that story. So that's a poem about a friend of mine here, and it was in my last book of poems, and he heard me read it, uh, maybe at Books and Books once, and said, I told him I'd written it, I didn't surprise him with it, but um, he said, you know, listen, I have to tell you something disappointing, Campbell. That's not my job title anymore. I said, oh, oh, I didn't realize. He said, I got promoted, and you won't, and this is a true story, and you won't believe my new job title. His new job title is President of Men's Bottoms. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. So uh, that last poem also, you know, is poking fun at poetry itself, too, saying that it's, it's, a, it's a tough gig like planting sunflowers on the moon. It may not be that tough, um, but it's certainly not a remunerative occupation writing poetry. It's not an art form America rewards very highly in that sense. So if you write poetry, it's because you really love writing poetry. Um, you love it because 
it is made of language, and language is a universal. You don't, it's, a, it's discouraging not to have one's pictures on the movie screen, not to have the backup band, but it's also hugely liberating. The only thing I need to construct my art is language and a pencil and a piece of paper. I don't even need the pencil and a piece of paper. People famously have written their poems um, in prison cells, in absolute poverty and blindness. So it's deeply universal and personal art form. It's also as big as the Odyssey and as small as a haiku, uh, a tiny poem of, uh, that I'm going to read one of to you. Uh, one of my very favorite poems by the Japanese haiku uh, master Basho. It's only seven words long in English. A bee staggers out of the peony. A bee staggers out of the peony. Just seven little words about a bee coming out of a beautiful, redolent flower, so full of like nectar and pollen. Seven words, a bee staggers out of the peony. But it's not really seven words, because a, uh, out, of, and the, they hardly count. They're just little connector words. It's really bee staggers peony. And bee and peony are nice, but they're just nouns. They're just things in the world. It's really that one word, isn't it, in the middle, staggers. The poem reduces to one word, staggers. And we suddenly think, when, when do we stagger? We stagger when we are intoxicated. We stagger when we are in love. We stagger when we are awed in wonder at the world. And that bee, suddenly anthropomorphized, staggers out of that peony, so overwhelmed by the sheer sensual wonder of the world. Poetry connects us because that bee that Basho wrote about came out of that flower in the 16th century, but we can still perceive it now as we share that instant. And if you really want the short answer of why I write poetry, it's because poetry staggers me. The world in its sensuality and delight intoxicates me, and language is my resource for making sense of it, and it's a profound joy to write poems, and that's why we do it. I'm going to end with one final poem. This is called The Human Heart. We construct it from tin and ambergris and clay, ochre, graph paper, a funnel of ghosts, whirlpool in a downspout full of midsummer rain. It is, for all its freedom and obstinance, an artifact of human agency in its maverick intricacy, its chaos reflected in earthly circumstance, its appetites mirrored by a hungry world like the lights of the casino in the coyote's eye. Old is the odor of almonds in the hills around Solano, filigreed and chanceled with flavor of blood oranges, fashioned from moonlight, yarn, nacre, cordite, shaped and assembled valve by valve, flange by flange, and finished with the carnal fire of interstellar dust. We build the human heart and lock it in its chest and hope that what we have made can save us.